I wanted to, to let folks know that our symposium is the third week of September this year. So uh, mark your calendars. And what we've done is the, our, our meeting will be on uh, Thursday and Friday of that week, but we have other, you know, other events that are in Boston that are pretty exciting earlier in the week. So on Tuesday, September 19th, we have the annual uh, Precision Medicine Conference, which is always like really well attended. Um, and Zach Kohani is the uh, is the uh, the host of that conference. So that's on Tuesday. On Wednesday, there's a special um, AI working group that some of Sean Murphy's uh, folks will be um, will be hosting. And this is this is really a um, kind of a exclusive AI working group, but they've decided to open it up to um, all participants. Um, so if you want to come for the whole week, you can you can also come to that meeting. And then Thursday and Friday will be our um, annual meeting. So we'll have our, uh, our our regular meeting on Thursday, and then we're going to do a really deep dive into um, some workshops on um, that Friday. So um, the agenda is under development. If you're interested at all in presenting um, or we have ideas or you know thoughts about our workshops, please um, please let us know. Um, as, as always, if you wanna get involved, we've got a number of working groups that you can join. You can um, uh, just fill out the form on our, uh, our website and um, we'll get you going. There's ontology, ETL, user interface, and then a new uh, committee on technology um, that Griffin Weber um, runs that has lots of different um, topics. So you're all invite, invited to those meetings. Um, and then if you're interested in, in presenting at one of these community meetings, we, um, we hold these every other month now. So we have a, a May agenda and a, a July agenda um, that are both open. So let us know. So um, I am going to hand this over I think Anna Palma is going to kick it off and talk about the new UI project. And then Nick will dive into some details. We'll have a demo and then we'll pass it to, uh, to Jeff, who will talk about the new release. All right. Um, hello, everyone. So actually, I'm just going to share my screen real quickly. Um, So I wanted to just talk before we go through the features, I wanted to just talk about sort of the genesis of the I2B2 UI um, redesign project. So it kind of started three years ago when the Shrine team at Harvard Catalyst decided to um, rewrite the UI for the Shrine web client. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar, the Shrine web client, um, which stands for the Shared Health Research Informatics Network, um, it's a federated query tool that connects the individual I2B2 sites. Um, and when it was originally released about a decade ago, it was based on the legacy I2B2 UI, which oops, um, looks something like this. And so um, we re redesigned it and released this web client. Um, and like I said, the difference between I2B2 and Shrine is that I2B2 is used at um, locally and provides a local count of patients at your institution. Um, whereas the idea for Shrine is that you can construct those similar um, queries, but be able to get an aggregate patient count from um, the network. So that's all the individual I2B2 sites in that network will provide a count back um, to the researcher. Um, and right now, the largest Shrine network um, connects 50 sites um, with data on over 100 million patients. So when we released this, it was pretty, um, lot of, lots of positive reviews. And so naturally, the next progression was to be able to apply uh, the redesign um, to I2B2. Um, and strategically, this makes a lot of sense since researchers usually end up using both web clients when they're trying to find their patient cohort. And so again, when we embarked on this project, there was a couple of goals that we wanted to make sure um, we met. So we wanted to place uh, I2B2's Yahoo user interface and um, you know, remove the dependencies on outdated code libraries. Um, and this would really allow us to add um, new functionality down the road and also eliminate any type of potential um, security risks. 
Um, and because we did this, we were also able to um, expand, um, expand the capabilities um, you know, for native browser APIs. Um, like I mentioned before, the second goal was to really unify uh, the I2B2 UI and the Shrine UI. Um, when we originally worked on the Shrine UIs, we actually uh, did a lot of background research, um, you know, doing needs and landscape analysis, wireframe iterations and focus groups. And we actually really used the I2B2 community um, to get a lot of feedback. And so when it came time to actually, um, you know, talk about the applying the Shrine UI, um, we couldn't just skin it and you know apply it onto I2B2. Um, and that's because there's differences in the technical stacks between the two application. Um, they are you know overlapping features, but they are distinct feature sets between I2B2 and Shrine. Um, and also I2B2 has a really robust community that builds these custom analytic tools and these plugin capabilities. So we had to make sure we built out these modules um, in the new uh, redesign. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, we do have the support. We have want to be able to support all the plugins that were created. So in the new UI, we've um, we've built support for legacy plugins, and we've also built support for native plugins. Um, and we also wanted to make it easy to install. We didn't want to require an entire new instance of I2v2, but rather the updates are going to be limited to just the HTML. JavaScript and um, CSS files. Um, and the last goal, like I mentioned, was you know, in leveraging the, the, the modern UI to be able to add future capabilities. So some of these um, include uh, being able to drag and drop components of the um, I2B2 UI into external applications like Jupyter Notebook and the framework that we chose um, allows us to do that. So now I'll pass it over to Nick. We'll talk about the features that we've uh, worked on. Uh, thank you. So uh, I know uh, Diane has those slides. So if we can get those up. Uh, wonderful. So uh, thank you, Anna Palma. Uh, as Anna Palma said, uh, this uh, redesign of the I2B2 UI is basically uh, a redevelopment and a rebuilding of the uh, entire front end visual aspects of the application. However, there is a lot of components that have been uh, retained and saved, such as the communication layer. And in doing that, some of the things that were going for this uh, first launch is to be able to have the I2B2, the modern I2B2 web client, uh, be able to uh, have feature parity with the legacy I2B2 client. And in doing that, we also wanted to add uh, additional functionality and additional features. Uh, we One of the biggest things that we went to focus on uh, was updating the style and uh, mirroring the uh, work that was done with the Shrine web client, uh, the way that they had uh, improved and uh, simplified the user interface for actually building a query. Uh, by doing that, uh, we were able to uh, create functionality that allows you to construct and run uh, queries uh, that are inclusive of certain data points or exclusive of certain data points within your search. Uh, it gives you the ability to have uh, multiple groups uh, and within each group have multiple uh, statements, multiple uh, uh, medical uh, flags uh, be searchable or excludable. Uh, you have the ability to produce uh, date range searches for uh, individual items within the groups or the groups themselves. Uh, you have the ability to specify multiple occurrences or how many occurrences, I should say, are going to uh, be required for a uh, patient to fulfill the uh, criteria of the query. And you have the ability to not only specify that laboratory tests have been performed, but also specify the outcomes of those laboratory tests, the values of, of say, glucose uh, level check. Uh, one of the other things we wanted to do is uh, really 
separate out the user interface branding and uh, visual elements uh, so that it is a standalone template HTML and CSS that you're able to go in there and uh, customize very simply. You don't need to be in, uh, intimately familiar with the internals of how the entire uh, modern web client works. You just need to look at an HTML file that works as a template and you can update uh, custom brand and you can just be a simple webmaster and do that. Uh, like Anna Palma said, one of the, the key uh, objectives of this new user interface that has been developed, the modern user interface, is going to be the fact that we are going to have the ability to support legacy plugins if that's what your site chooses to do. Uh, we do recommend uh, that legacy plugins be moved to a newer design uh, that we're calling the native plugins. Uh, the newer design gives you a lot more functionality. It gives you isolation uh, so that your code is not interfering with other plugins or interfering with the main uh, framework that is the new user interface. Uh, and also the user interface cannot go and uh, pollute the environment that your native plugin is being created in. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, Nick, I'm having a problem advancing these slides for some reason. There we go. Yep, uh, we see that. Uh, so some of the features in order to, to make this modern web client feature parity with the legacy web client is you have the ability to have breakdowns when you run a query. Uh, breakdowns are uh, little routines that are both on the server side as well as some uh, display, uh, or they're actually on the server side, they do an analysis. Uh, and they provide you uh, data. And if you load uh, breakdown uh, modules into your I2B2 server, this is going to be able to uh, display those breakdown graphs. Uh, you also are going to have, of course, the ability to navigate ont ontological terms uh, or concepts, uh, medical concepts. Uh, and on top of that, you'll have the ability to search and view the results of those searches when you're looking for a specific term and not browsing. Uh, you have the ability to uh, get details on a concept, whether you're navigating it or whether you're searching for it, you have the ability to bring up that term and give it uh, and get extended information about that term displayed. Uh, you have also a workspace. Uh, so this is going to be the same exact workspace that is in the legacy client where you have a root folder and you have the ability to create new folders. You have the ability to rename items, rename folders. Uh, you have the ability to drag and drop uh, items uh, from the rest of the user interface into the uh, workplace uh, I'm sorry, workspace area, uh, but also uh, take uh, saved terms, previously saved terms or queries or whatnot, and drag that into the query building tool. Or uh, as we had mentioned, uh, you also are going to have that ability in this new web client to be able to drag and drop things from workspace out into uh, other external applications that uh, support the new uh, I2B2 UI standards. Uh, you have the ability to search for queries. You have the ability to find uh, results for the that query search. You have the ability to uh, browse the last n number of queries. And if you don't see it in that list, you can just uh, keep loading that list and making it longer and longer until you do find the query that you're looking for. Uh, once you find a query, you have the ability to drag and drop that query into the query tool, just like in the legacy client, and it will repopulate that query that was previously run and show you all the uh, representation of, of the search criteria that was done in order to uh, get the results as well as it repopulates the uh, breakdown tables and uh, the query results that were retrieved uh, when you ran that query. Uh, and then also uh, you're gonna have, uh, like I had said earlier, the ability to apply dates to individual terms within the search uh, window, within the search 
tool. Uh, and also you have the ability as criteria of a new search, you have the ability to use a previously run search as uh, a selector in that. So you can take a, a query that is your uh, population and you can drag and drop that and use that as your base population and then create uh, queries that run uh, additional, uh, run and search for additional subpopulations in that core population from that first query. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, we are nearing the end of uh, this first initial uh, launch. Uh, it's still a ways away, uh, but we have uh, some final features we're finishing up that are either in QA and development uh, and a few things that are not yet in development. But uh, basically, we are uh, also going to be supporting temporal queries uh, where you have the ability to define events and define uh, those events and the order in which they occur in a patient population uh, in your search. Uh, you have the ab uh, ability to specify that uh, terms within a group uh, occur within the same financial encounter or the same encounter. Uh, the ability to specify that uh, items within a group are the same data instance uh, which allows you the ability to uh, utilize uh, what we're calling complex modifiers, uh, where you're looking at uh, multiple uh, modifiers on a single uh, data point in the EHR. Uh, we are also looking at uh, simple modifiers, uh, having the capabilities to view and select modifiers that are in the ontology uh, in the terms list. Uh, we are uh, currently finishing up uh, the last uh, set of bugs that were discovered, and we are finishing up, and it's almost ready for QA, the PDF report, uh, that when you run a query and you want to print it out uh, or email that information uh, to uh, another collaborator, uh, you have the ability to uh, print out a report on that query uh, so that they can use that for their records or use that on their local site if they're not yet on uh, Shrine. Uh, and then we're, we've got uh, options that are in the application. This is kind of uh, low hanging fruit that we're finishing up, final things. Uh, so you kind of go to your profile and drop down menu, and it gives you a whole bunch of options uh, that you can do with the application menu. You can right click on uh, certain windows within the new user interface, and right clicking gives you the ability to set. Uh, how many queries, uh, previously run queries are displayed at a time, um, how uh, you're going to show how many child concepts, show hidden terms or synonyms, uh, enable a display of patient counts, and a whole bunch of other things, uh, just minor uh, user interface tweaks. Uh, we are also working on uh, viewing modifiers within the search window. Uh, so that is in development right now. Uh, we are uh, also looking into uh, search concepts in the uh, hierarchy view. So when you search concept in uh, the uh, ontology, uh, you're enabling some of the features to accelerate um, interacting with the ontology. Um, that's more of a technical aspect. Um, and then also finally, we're, uh, the final big pieces that we're uh, in the planning phase of is uh, obfuscated users. Uh, so you have different level of uh, data uh, access in I2B2 and uh, some of those uh, allow people to run obfuscated, uh, obfuscated queries, uh, which kind of uh, alt uh, subtly alters the number of results coming back for data privacy reasons, uh, the ability to change your color scheme, and the ability to access multiple projects that may be on a single I2B2 host. Uh, and then the final last thing uh, would be the incorporation of CQ2 clinical query two uh, sketches, which are uh, probabilistic uh, data structures that allow you to 
uh, get a very, very fast result from a very large data set. And that's uh, been something that has been incorporated in um, Clinical Query 2, Griffin Weber's uh, project. And I believe that that is all I have. And let's kick that over to Anna Palma and have her present and show you uh, the new user interface as it exists uh, in, from our last sprint. Thank you. Right then, so let's go ahead and share screen. Okay, um, so right before I show you this, I know I just showed you a quick screenshot of how the, um, the uh, existing I2B2 legacy looks like. So I just wanna take a quick uh, look at this. So um, I just constructed a simple query here. Um, so the group are groups are read from left to right, um, within a group, you have um, the concepts are related to one another um, by the or um, logical operator. Um, and between groups, it's um, by the and logical operator. Um, so this is sort of the layout of I legacy I2B2. And then I also wanted to just show how we um, worked with or how we've redesigned the UI for Shrine and then hopefully you can appreciate where we landed with the design for the new I2B2 um, UI. So let me go ahead and log in here. So again, you'll notice um, we borrowed a lot of the color schemes um, from the Shrine UI, but we th they are customizable. So you'll be able to modify the colors as needed and also um, be able to have different um, branding up here. So that's all customizable to the application. Um, one of the things we really liked about the Shrine UI was being able to build the queries from the top to the bottom and so orienting them from the top to bottom versus left to right. And it really sort of maximized the real estate in this specific um, well, panel. Sorry about that. Um, and so once I'm going to just go ahead and drop some concepts here. Um, I let me see if I can do a simple one first. So when I drop it here, we have these uh, helper statements. Um, so we want it to be sort of uh, self-explanatory to the user what type of um, query they are building. So here it's find patients um, with this specific concept. Um, I can easily swap it to an exclusion concept by clicking the without radio buttons and it changes the color just to really drive that um, the point across that it's it's now an exclusion concept. Um, and so as I keep looking for concepts, I can drag them over into the existing group or the next group. Um, one of the things we've done here is that we only display the next group once um, the previous group is active and like has a concept in it. Um, down here, I can specify the concepts for, uh, sorry, the date ranges for the groups. And you'll notice here that it automatically um, appended it. I'm gonna just grab a couple of concepts here just so you can see how that looks like. Um, if I decided that some of these concepts actually want an individual date range, I can go ahead and change this. And so it will honor um, an individual date range for that specific concept. And likewise, this is where I would change um, the number of occurrences if I wanted to. Um, you know, as you build down the tree, I will um, just pull over a lab test. Let me see if I can find one here. Um, So this is how you would specify uh, lab values. Um, I can say no flag or by flag or um, enter a specific value. So this drop down looks very similar to how it currently is um, for I2B2. And if I want to edit, and this icon appears here where I'm able to edit uh, that um, value itself. Um, on the left hand side, I have the ontology, and so. We um, actually combined the views um, into one view for browse and search. So as I was doing previously, I can just keep expanding these folders to find the concepts 
um, that I need. But if I wanted to search for a concept, I would just use this, um, uh, sorry, this input right here, um, enter the um, concepts that I'm looking for, and then it will expand to show um, the corresponding search results. I can further go and um, filter the search by uh, the different domains. Um, and then if, for example, if I knew the exact code that um, I needed, I'd be able to select that, um, select the, the actual coding system and enter the code itself, and it will be able to recognize that. So here, I'm just gonna go ahead and select the ICD-10 and then re-execute the search. So you'll see it narrowed it down to 200 results. Um, and then when I drag it here, again, similar, like, similar concepts. Um, one of the things that the team is currently working on is um, right, if you right click this term, so the search results are actually displaying um, the relative path to that concept and any concepts um, within that folder that matches the search criteria. But if you wanted to look at this terms um, in the context of its sibling relationship, we're working on implementing that feature that would allow you to do that. So when I exit, it um, takes me back to the browse view and I can still go ahead and construct um, my query down below. Um, and sorry, I'm just going to go ahead and run this query. And so here I have all my breakdown options. So I'm just going to um, select the most common ones and run that below. Um, and so as it's running, um, probably had a pretty uh, restricted concept in our data set. So of one patient here and then down below it, it will um, display all the different demographic distributions for that specific concepts. So we have the, the gender breakdown, uh, vital status, the race, and also the age. And then we have the table view down here. Um, and these are easily expandable and collapsible. So you can um, expand and collapse to see the information that's most important to you. Um, and then Again, on the left-hand side, we have the workspace. So um, each time um, the user uses it, there's a root folder um, and they can easily go ahead and add a new folder. They can annotate the existing folders and be able to drag concepts here. So I can drag this concept down here. And it just add it over there. And then similarly in my, um, in the qu previous queries, um, you'll see that the query I just ran um, is up here. I can go ahead and search, um, execute a search on the previous queries. And then I can also filter my search results by the different result types that come back. I'm just gonna go ahead and clear this out. So say if I wanted to reload this uh, the concepts here, I would just go ahead and drag the query and um, load it into this name column here, and that will pre-populate all of the concepts back up here. Okay, um, a few other things I wanted to show. So um, in order uh, for the terms themselves, I can highlight this uh, uh, concept here and go to the info tab. Sorry, I'll do this trigger, um, the show mo more info, and that will automatically um, show that term info um, in this view. And likewise, I can do that also from the, um, the builder where we're building out the queries. If I click on this eye icon, then the information will reflect uh, the concept that you, that you clicked on. Okay. Um, and then what other things I want to, oh, so this um, tool here is how we are now uh, allowing users to um, look at the plugin capabilities. So in the legacy I2B to web client, that was this analysis tool was sort of in the application menu, but we pulled it down into the builder view. So there is um, a flow between trying to find the patients and then using the analysis tool to further um, look at your data set. And so these 
example that you're seeing right now is how we've loaded both the legacy plugins and the sorry legacy pl plugins and the native plugins so to a user they're not really seeing the difference they're just seeing all the um, um, plugins that have been developed okay yeah no problem. we have a question from Mich michelle can you drop a previous query into a find patient panel yes so i can let me go show that so that's like nested query so if i want to take this diabetes concept i can uh, drop that here and now it's recognizing that entire query as its own concept so i should be able to um you know augment this with additional concepts and run the query and then the other thing i wanted to show was temporal queries so the way we decided to implement temporal queries is um, we wanted to mimic the design that we did in Shrine. So let me go ahead and drop a concept here. Um, so it, when I click this when button, the sort of layout of the um, panel changes. And so uh, for a temporal query, the user has to define at a minimum of two events. Um, and they'll have to have concepts in each of the event panel. Um, for each of the events, you have the option to specify a date range. And then what we did was we decided to have this default relationship between the first and second event. So uh, the way we implemented this was um, in similar fashion that the legacy I2B2 wizard works where um, it's always starting from the first event and every relationship is is built in a sequential manner from that first event. So event one is the first event that a record followed by event two and event three and so on, so on. And so the relationships that we we have this default relationship between the first and second event. And if the user decided they wanted to change the relationship, they would just um, click this drop down here, which exposes all the different controls and they can change the controls to what fits um, what fits their criteria. And so here I'm adding date ranges. Um, and so I can uh, close that up. We are working on uh, being able to wrap this text. So it's pretty um, neat in the way that the user can read that information. And if I continue to go down, I can add any number of events to this um, to this temporal query, and so if I keep going down the list, um, at, like I said, add n number of events, but the minimum is you have to have at least two events. Um, and then for the uh, panels that are not associated with the temporal queries, the it will assume that that's your base population. So we're not explicitly calling it the base population, um, but it's we're trying to clearly delineate what um, what concepts and relationships are part of the temporal query and what's part of the underlying base population query. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a few other things I wanted to show. Um, so one of the new things we've implemented is this idea of uh, same encounters and same instance. And so uh how we approach this concept is we offer um we designed this uh link icon um for each panel so anytime a panel um is active and when i say active it has a concept inside the panel um we are assuming that the panel is treated um as an independent panel meaning that there is no relationship between panel one and panel two in terms of a timing constraint um, as soon as I um, click this link, I have the option now of linking the first panel um, into a set called, you know, the same encounter or the same instance. And what it does is that it's now creating, a, um, forming a relationship between panel one to have occurred in some type of encounter. And then as I'm building out my query, I'm able to apply this setting to any of my other panels. So. In this example, um, my first group and my third group are now related to one another because I want them to occur in the same encounter, whereas panel two is an independent 
in terms of its timing. If I decide to unlink, I can unlink it so it returns back to an independent panel, or um, I can um, specify that it's the same instance and you'll notice that there is a color change and we use the eye icon to specify that. Um, so I'll just point out the instance is mostly used for multiple modifiers. If I have time, I can build out a more likely uh, example that would make sense, but I just wanted to highlight the functionality for right now. Uh, one of the things I don't think I've had I showed yet was actually how we have modifiers here. So it's very similar to the legacy web client when you expand a concept if it has modifiers we will display the modifiers right underneath it. Um, if I drag this concept over um, we append that term the modifier next to the concept so it's clear that it is a modifier that you uh, dragged over. Okay, and the last few bits I wanted to show uh, was um, some of the application settings that we have. So here underneath the, the user menu, um, we have this query options, which tells you how long you want to run the query for. It's defaulted to about three minutes. Um, and then this um, link here will link to the messaging logs. So it's the same UI that's in um, I2B2 is its own window and we support all the different filters that are up here. And then for um, the terms, um, we have, again, another set of options. So to access it, we're right clicking here and that will pull up this view. So now you can um, you know, show hidden terms, so synonyms, enable the patient counts, short term, whatever the options are, and it will reset the ontology so you're able to look at those. Um, let me see if I can get an example here. Yeah, so you'll see that some of the terms are in blue. I, I forgot exactly what they're for. And then some of them are in white. I think hidden terms are in red. Um, I believe in our demo data, we don't have the counts um, uploaded, but the counts do appear next to the concept if you selected that option. And these settings apply for both the um browse view and for the um search view let's see if i go back here let's clear this then i click this let's see if the view report is working let me log into the this is our other tier might not be loaded. So we do have the query report. So it's, I think it's just I'm on the wrong branch, but um, it will pop up the query report similarly um, as it's laid out in, in I2B2. And you'll be able to print the report from that view. All right, I think that was my demo. Nick, was there anything else you wanted to share or anything else I should review? Uh, no, that would be it. I think that it would be a little bit hectic for us to uh, change the branch on the dev environment. So let's not okay. do that. Okay. Um, I know I went a little over time, but if there are any questions, um, happy to take them um, at the end after Jeff's um, presentation. You know, Anna Palma, um, Michelle has another one. <laughs> can you export as a CVS as you can in Shrine? Uh, when she's um, she's talking about the report functionality, correct, Michelle? Yes. Yeah. So that's the idea. So when you um, when the data is loaded here and you print the report, that will bring up your um, local machines option. So you'll be able to export the data. Um, but will it just be as a PDF as it is now in I two B two, or will you be able to do a CSV as well? I think if I can jump in real quick, I think the CSV uh, export is actually a plugin. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think in that we have it loaded, but in Shrine, oh, in it's, Shrine it's the it's default. Yeah. yeah, in Shrine, it's the default. Um, yeah. I don't think that we have that in what we're working on now, but it sounds like something that would be very simple to uh, create as a plugin. Yeah. 
and just okay. have it. At, I, I know that for a different project that is already uh, working with this user interface, we did create an export uh, CSV uh, plugin. Uh, so that's already been created, but it's uh, currently going against the CQ2 backend. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If there's any other questions, I'll be monitoring the chat and I can get back to you there. Thank you. Thanks, Anna Prama. If you want to jump in. All right, Jeff, you're on. All right. Uh, so um, I want to talk a little bit about the upcoming ITB2 release that we're aiming to get out by the end of the summer. We're we're planning to package a, like kind of in co coinciding with the the ITB2 meeting at the end of the summer. Um, so we're we're putting a lot of stuff into this, and uh, the 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 main thing, of course, is the new UI, which you all just saw, and we want to bundle that in the new release. Um, so, so that's that's kind of the big feature. But we're also working on a couple of other pretty important changes. Um, one is supporting I2B2 on OMOP out of the box. So back in 2018, Lori Phillips led some work to uh, support uh, other data models um, on top of the I2B2 server, such as OMOP which can be kind of viewed as a, a bunch of fact tables. And I have, I have a slide on that in a couple of minutes, but let's not switch to that yet. Um, so we've, uh, our colleagues at Pittsburgh, Michelle especially, has uh, updated uh, this concept by creating an ACT ontology that has OMOP codes at the end. And my screenshot is a little small. I think I have another one on the next slide, so that I'll come, we'll come back to that. But she has embedded all of the OMOP codes, both the non-standard and the standard codes, which I can talk about in a minute, uh, into that ontology. So you point the ontology at your OMOP tables, and you can query um, OMOP tables with an ITB2 ACT ontology, which is really cool. We've been working on some speed optimizations. Now we've got a 3 million patient synthetic data set that uh, is a combination of SynPuff and Cynthia data. And we, from able to query the ITB2 queries in like under a minute now, which is is pretty good, pretty comparable to what you might expect in the three million patient data set with ITB2 data. Uh, so that that will be releasing in the next release. Uh, another thing that is uh, very important is well, there's an enhanced data export. We've we've had plugins do export for a long time, but uh, the CSV export plugin that is going to be bundled with the new UI, I think, as well. Uses the um, the PDO XML, meaning it has to hit the server to get each and every patient, and it sends back a big XML chunk and takes quite a bit of time. So uh, Mike has engineered a new way to do data export on the server side and then get the file to the client. And during q and I'll, I'll, maybe someone will have a question on that. I might can go into more detail. The other really important thing that we're they're working on is job scheduling. And we're going to use the Java Quartz scheduler toolkit for this. Um, the reason we're doing this is we're increasingly have, having and going to have a bunch of uh, post-processing scripts that people can run. We have the we call it the total num script, which counts the number of patients with everything in the ontology and puts numbers next to every ontology item. Um, so scheduling that would be useful rather than having a DBA go in and manually run it every time you refresh the data. We're, we're going to have additional options to the sites will be able to run as well. We're going to have um, some loyalty cohort stuff that we're working on, some phenotyping stuff that we're working on. And allowing um, users, uh, administrators, to seamlessly be able to run those jobs without, you know, taking up an individual person's time will be important uh, going forward. Um, let's see. I think I got a question. Um, oh, that is a question about the UI. So I'll finish my spiel and then we'll answer that one. 
Um, okay, next slide, Diane. So this is just more on the OMOP stuff, which I kind of already that dove into. But the way it works is you take the shells, act OMOP ontology, you have a bunch of views that make each of the OMOP tables look like an I2B2 fact table, and then you point them at the OMOP tables and seamlessly get I2B2 API capability on your OMOP tables. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and this is a little bit more readable version of the ontology slide. So you can see the left has patient counts for our 3 million patient sample data set, um, which we, I don't know, I find that exciting that we're able to query that many OMOP patients. Um, the, the right side shows, you know, the ACT ontology, which many are familiar with. As you drill into it, you get to more and more specific codes. codes. Underneath uh, those codes, there are two uh, inactive terms that they're actually queried they're just not selectable individually uh, one has an ns at the end of it and that means non-standard so omop prefers terminologies like snomad arx norm loink so if you have something coded in a different terminology say icd10 it's going to be a non-standard omop code so those are inherently queryable in this ontology because they're automatically captured by um, by this. Uh, and then the standard codes are, like, like I said, things like SNOMED and Moink and RX norm, and those are also captured by this. There's a, there's another technical detail where you have to query both the, uh, the source concept ID and the concept ID. And it made, it made life a little more difficult for Michelle, I'm sure, and it made speed optimization a bit harder, but I think it, it works pretty well now. Um, but that, that's really for OMOP aficionados who are really interested in the technical details. Uh, I think that's my last slide. So um, I'll take a, I'll take questions if anyone has them about the new release, anything related to the new release. And also we can do the UI questions and maybe Nick Granapama wants to take uh, Robert's question about the same instance. Actually, just typing out a response. Um, so the question was uh, how users will perceive the term same instance uh, and same, same financial encounter is somewhat intuitive, but I'm not sure the same is true for instance and if there are any alternative terms. Um, so that's a great suggestion. I think part of it will be on how we train users to interpret the difference between same encounter and um, same instance. I think we could probably use same financial encounter to help delineate that a bit more. Um, and then I think it would be actually kind of useful. And I would, um, if Griffin was on the call, we probably have this as an agenda item for one of the UI working groups to sort of um, workshop some of the terminology, because that's also really key in terms of making the UI a bit more usable is, is sort of differentiating between the technical meaning of those terms and sort of how the, the we want the user to perceive um, those terms. Um, so I'll take that suggestion back to the team. And I think I'll also push to have as an agenda items for one of the um, monthly Wednesday UI working group calls. And also, if I can just jump in, I think that uh, one of the reasons we went with the uh, same instance uh, verbiage for this release, uh, this upcoming release, is the fact that uh, that's how it is in the legacy client. So if you're uh, a legacy client use power user, I should say, and you actually use uh, same uh, instance uh, in your queries, uh, we don't want it to uh, all of a sudden disappear in this new version. Uh, so we're keeping the same. Uh, verbiage for right now, but uh, as Anna Palma said, uh, we're definitely looking to uh, modernize uh, not just the user interface uh, look and feel, but also uh, the way in which it's used. So thank you, Anna Palma. Any, any other questions? You know, we, in, we invite others to, to join this meeting and, you know, demonstrate their work. Um, or join our committee on technology. I know uh, Michael Lynn from Mayo will be joining our committee on technology next month to uh, demonstrate a, um, a, a plugin that they've developed that they're pretty excited about that they want to make sure people are aware of. 
So I think, you know, trying, trying to get people to, to share is, um, I know it's hard, everybody's got so many meetings, but um, I really want to promote that. The other thing is we're going to, in the sep September meeting, our symposium, and also hopefully in the, uh, the November AMIA meeting, we'll be doing um, uh, technical workshops, and that will include the new UI, and hopefully more information about the, the OMOP um, work um, also, uh, Jeff. Just because you know the Odyssey committee is the community is so big, we want to make sure people are really aware of what we're doing. Um, there's no competition between data models. We 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 want to be able to serve you know whatever people have. So, any other questions or thoughts or comments? All right. Well, I think it's uh, I think it's probably lunchtime. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, again, we'll we'll make sure that the slides and the um, the video is uh, included on our website um, soon. So um, if anybody wants to to show this um, to their colleagues, just check the website in a, in a week or so. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.